Gig Gab, episode 323 for Tuesday, October 26th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Banzoogle. We're at banzoogle.com. You get to go to banzoogle.com. You try it for free for 30 days, and then promo code Gig Gab gets you 15% off the first year of your subscription. We'll talk about the details of why you're going to do that shortly. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. You know, I paused in the middle of my intro for several reasons, Paul. And one of them was that I thought I was going to chip a tooth with all those twos in the intro. It's at 323 Tuesday, October 26, 2021. Whew, we got to move back to Mondays, man. It's an alliteration <laughs> problem. It's yeah. A, yeah, it's a real issue. And then the other was I'm used to do, doing my Mac Geek Up podcast, which we've been doing on video since basically since pandemic started. Right. And and that was the, one of the catalysts to, to that. And I was enjoying being able to be a little bit lazier visually during our intro because I heard the intro music play. And then I was like, oh, right. Yep. People are going to see this. And like, no, nope, they're not. I can do whatever I want right now. Doesn't matter as long as I don't make the wrong noises, you know, or if the noises are need to be entertaining or, or edited. Uh, but it did get me to think like, would we be better serving our audience if we did share this show on video? So I don't, I don't know the answer to that feedback at gig podcast.com. They could let us know. What do you think about that? Mr. Ken? I don't know. I think I, I assume that most people like put this on while they work out or on a train going to work or something like that. Or, you know, so I, I, I don't know, you know, we're not demonstrating much stuff. Right. So I, I'm not exactly sure what the value of, of our faces, at least mine is a face made, <laughs> made for audio. <laughs> well, it's, you know, the value is that there are people who watch podcasts. Um, there, there is an audience of podcast viewers slash listeners on YouTube. And we are, we do publish this show to YouTube and there have been episodes that have gone, you know, spectacularly well on YouTube. Our our episode that we did about Tom Petty, I think we titled it Three Chords in the Truth or Four Chords in the Truth or something. I forget. Uh, that one has seen tens of thousands of, of views slash listens. Hmm. The views are of our logo while you hear the episode just the same as you would on the audio stream. So there is an audience over there and we are missing reaching them by not being more visual. Now, whether that is important to us or not is a whole other thing. The other thing that we've been able to do with videos on, on Mac Geek Cab is we chop out segments and we share just segments of those videos to, um, to help expose people, to new audience members to the show by saying, here's a little snippet of, of what you might get on, on gig Gab. And so I, I'm, I mean, it, it's kind of weird to ask an audience that is, definitively audio only if they would want to hear us on video, because maybe this isn't for all of you. Not that we would change what we're doing, but in expanding it, I don't know. I don't know. I would love to hear what people say. I mean, I, I've always assumed, you know, like remember when Steve Jobs said that podcasts are the most interesting thing going on in radio right now. So, right. you know, I've always just assumed, I mean, I've seen podcasts, but when it's just talking heads, I'm not really, I'm not really sure what the inherent value is. I'd rather have the portability than watch people talk, but I'd love to hear, I, you know, my opinion is only one opinion. So it doesn't, it, yeah. I'd be curious. You, you and yeah, me I'd only be matter because we get veto power over these decisions. <laughs> yeah, I would, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't mind doing some special things every once in a while, you know, where there's a, like if we're demonstrating something or, sure. or, uh, you know, or, or interacting with somebody interesting would have been cool to have Jan Hammer, you know, on, on video. That would, I mean, I, I would want to watch. I mean, it was you know, hard ever, enough to get Jan watch him to use read any, the phone book. Right. <laughs> that's true. But it was hard enough to get Jan to use anything other. I mean, he was literally sitting in his studio in his barn which has, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of microphones and other gear, of course. Like, it's a full-on studio. People have recorded records there, including Jan, but but he also farms it out to other people. And he was sitting there in that studio when he recorded this. 
and he used the microphone built into his MacBook Pro. <laughs> so I don't know that Jan, much as Jan and I love each other and much as, as Jan, you know, as, as he tells me, Dave, I'll do anything for you. I don't know that he would do that. <laughs> yeah. well, so maybe, you know. maybe Aronoff then. Yeah, Kenny Aronoff definitely would have. Where I would have loved to have video was when we had David Jamison on talking about gig yeah. performer, right? Like those. Yeah. So maybe, maybe we open that door that we, uh, when we are demoing things where video would make sense, we use video. I mean, I have it all set up here, right? Because I do it for the other shows, so it's it's really not a it's not a huge leap for us to just go and do that. Um, so maybe we, maybe we leave that door open for ourselves for, you know, if there's a specific gear gab segment in an episode, where we're like, ah, you know what, this might be a thing that we could show people like when like I'm dem it. demoing a plugin in logic, trying to talk about it versus showing it like th there, there could be helpful things. And so, yeah. All right. Sounds like we've decided without even listening to anybody. So you go, you folks <laughs> let us know feedback at gig gab podcast. I like it. I played a very interesting gig on Thursday night, Mr. Kent. Is this the Marvin Gaye groups grooves from heaven that you have been working on? It was. Yeah, that's right. So for those of you who don't uh, remember or didn't listen to the last episode, I was invited to play percussion on uh, my friend, Stu Dias, who uh, is putting on a series once a month, this club called the press room in, uh, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, where he's playing an album once a month. He did songs from big pink the first month. I was not involved in that. And then, uh, and then we did what's going on on Thursday night. And we had, I want to say we had three rehearsals. Now this is only a 38 minute record, right? And we did stretch it out. We played an hour and it's very cool that he was able to work things out. And the press room is it, it, like very open to having us come and play just one record. And he, we had somebody do an intro for us, um, uh, Stu's friend Zach did this intro where he sort of talked for about five minutes about the record, maybe even a little bit longer. And then when we took the stage, Stu thanked everybody for coming and said one of the smartest things that I think could have been said was that, you know, look, we're here because we want to play an album. And because generally speaking, we, we don't listen to albums as much anymore. We listen to a song at a time or, you know, whatever. Right. And he's like, so, I think this is a nice way to appreciate albums and we get to do it as a group together. But I need to tell you, that's all we're playing tonight. When we're done, we're done. We would very much appreciate your applause. Uh, so feel free to do that. But there will be no encore. There is nothing special, extra planned. This is the special. It is this album. And 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 then we basically started and played it. And he... He added some things to it. He added some sound effects and some um, contextual things to sort of help paint what the the picture of how he interprets what this album is and what it was at the time and those sorts of things. Can I can I ask you a bunch of questions uh, about this? Oh yeah, yeah. Can can I just can I get to the end of of the? the, the yeah, sorry. No, 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 no. I I want to make sure I don't miss out on this because I got myself on a tangent here. The we had three rehearsals. We re re rehearsed half of the album at the first rehearsal, the second half of the album at the second rehearsal. And then the third rehearsal was the night before the gig and we were going to run the whole thing. We did not get to run the whole thing at this final rehearsal. So we got through all the songs. We talked through the transitions. We came up with a map for things, but the gig was the first and thus far only time that we have played it all the way through. And that in and of itself I think made it pretty magical. There was, there were many things that made it magical, but all of us hitting the stage and we talk about not hitting the stage, feeling complacent or, or, you know, expecting great success and, you know, being aware and alert and boy, howdy, were we all aware and alert when we hit the stage because we did not know what was going to happen. We knew what sure. we sort of, we knew how it wanted, we wanted it to end, but um, how we were going to get there was not necessarily something we all knew and we knew that we were going to have to listen and watch and all that stuff. Uh, and it, it, it went spectacularly well. I have some more things to share about that, but uh, now that I've, I've said my piece question. No, no, I, I appreciate it. So, um, you know, I have a dotted line experience with this, with a couple of tribute shows that I've done sure. and that friends of mine have done. Right. And I, I think these are great things um, just to inject special into your local music scene, right? Yeah. 
So for first question, uh, the guy who organized this, he's done how many of them so far? Uh, this was his second one, but I know that he has them scheduled through April. I don't know how public he is being with what albums he has chosen for the future. So I will refrain from sharing anything that I know about them, but, but he Got does it. have it planned once a month. I'm not, I may be doing one or possibly two others with him, uh, but I'm not on all the gigs. So, and how do you know the guy who's doing, who's producing these? Um, I, I, he, Stu Dias is the, the leader of a band around here called the soggy po boys. Uh, I have done, other gigs with him. I think I talked a couple of years ago about how it was called sort of last minute by my friend, John McCormick, who had a, has a project called paint box to play a one, a one song show opening up TEDx in the the morning of like some Tuesday morning in Portsmouth or something like that. And I played congas on that. Stu sang in that band. And so, uh, or in that project, whatever you want to call it, not a band project, whatever it is. And so we spent a lot of time hanging out, uh, you know, for both rehearsing for that gig, but also, you know, just hanging out, waiting for the show to start and, you know, all that stuff that you do before a gig. And so we got to know each other there. And then we s sat on a bus to the airport together randomly. So we've just sort of gotten to know each other by being involved in the same scene and having a couple of things. But it was kind of random when he he texted me and asked me, would you play on this? And, and I think I said it in the last episode that I, I texted him back the next day and was like, Hey, am I playing drums or percussion? Cause I've never right. played drums with you on a, a project. And he's like, Oh no, I want you on percussion for this. The drummer that, that he's got on this, this guy, John met him, fantastic drummer. He and I are most definitely cut from the same cloth. He went deeper into jazz than I did. I sort of took a, a turn into rock, but we have the same roots, you know, big rush fans, big jazz fans, big fusion fans. Right. Like, so we, we were able to think as one, which was fantastic. Yeah. So. Yeah, All right, so good. a couple of business questions, yeah. and these the the both of the ones that he's done have been performed at the same place. Yes, yes. And tell me about the place. How big is it? Um, it's a oh man, I don't know how many people. It's a it's a three well two and a half story bar in downtown Portsmouth, which has been there forever. Uh, it was bought by new owners a few years ago and renovated. And now all the bands play upstairs, which is a little weird, uh, but it's a beautiful stage, a beautiful sound system uh, and, and a great engineer. Mike Marchand engineered the night and oh, man, he did a great which job. Which is ballpark at 100? Yeah, 150 150 people, people maybe right, up, up on that floor, 150, 200 people. It was sold out, whatever that number is for this particular right. gig. Yep. But if, you, if it was more than 200 people, you'd be surprised, right? Yeah, I think it's probably, right. yeah, because the Stone Church, it's probably about double the size of the Stone Church, and technically the Stone Church is 99 people, but I've been in there with about 250, but, you know. All right, I like am that. getting to a point, trust me on sure, this. So, um, yeah. um, and fine. remember, what did he charge to get in? I have no idea, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> let's right. let's say it was uh, 10 to 15 bucks. Okay. I think, I think that's probably about where it was, yeah. All right. I, I'm, I'm going to look and see if I can figure that out while we're talking so here. We put all this together and we kind of, how many musicians were in the, in the group? Uh, let's see. There were six of us, two keyboard players. One played uh, Rhodes, one played uh, a, a Hammond B3 with a Leslie, which is wonderful to be on stage with. Awesome. And, yep. And then, and the guy who played Rhodes, they both played phenomenally well. Um, and then uh, me, Stu, bass player, drummer, and everybody can play like it was, it's, you know me, I like to be on stage and feel like I'm the, the guy who has the most to learn. And so I definitely felt that way at this gig. So, yeah. right. Right. And do you, did he, um, need to do any promotion for the show or was it a mail list or, you know, is he well known enough that it was his name and, and, uh, it wasn't a very hard sell of the tickets. Yeah. I have no idea. And, I have right. no idea how it was. You're in the I, band. I, 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 yeah, I really like on this one, I had so much else going on in life in, in with life in general right now that I, I did, I, you know, I did what you're supposed to do day of the gig. I, I shared, and I did this before the gig too, you know, where I, I shared the event out cause I was excited about it, you know, and, but I did it the day of the gig and in the, what you're supposed to do department. When I shared it day of the gig morning of the gig, I said, I think there's still a couple of tickets left. It turns out that was true both that there were a couple of tickets left, but not very many tickets left. And it sold out be long before we got there got that it. night, which was great. Yeah. But where I'm getting to in all this is net net. 
it was a labor of love for you. Like a, like a lot of prep to do a one-off show is a labor of love. We were paid, we were paid quite well for it, but, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, all, most of my music is a labor of love. I, I figure any, anything except the wedding band, you're not really getting paid what, what your time is worth. <laughs> right. Right. You, you know, but, but yeah, it, it was definitely a labor of love. It was a pleasure to get to play with these musicians. Um, and we were all well, paid very well for it. Yeah. So I'm kind of almost to my point here in, in that, in my experience of doing these things, you know, um, I've organized projects where I've asked people to play and they have, uh, turned it down because it wasn't enough money. Sure. Right? And these are, you know, local musicians or, you know, on the principle that, you know, their time should be worth more than what I was able to offer for something. Right. Right. So not it was, a, it was a, 10 bucks to, to get in by the way. So there okay. you go. Yep. Uh, and, and do you uh, sense that he, that, that you were paid not related to total gross for ticket sales? Like, like does he fund this for, for his own, you know, because he loves to do these types of things. Um, no, we were, we were paid based on, it, there, there was a minimum for the night and then we were paid, uh, extra because there was extra money on the table. Ah, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. So th this is kind of my thing. You know, like I, I am a big fan of these types of events. Yeah. Um, because I think they're, you know, for people who are live music fans in your community, uh, they inject a certain amount of fun, you know, and, and, uh, but also you do them and you do them right, always be performing and you get good players who are diligent in preparation. And, you know, you can't rehearse these things 50 times to do a one-off, No, but you know, like the ones I've done, I think like four rehearsals, right. And uh, I would have you know, liked very, a fourth rehearsal. We got our fourth rehearsal. It just happened to be, you know, in front of the, the crowd uh, people We're, right. we, we are doing, there are three more of these particular nights booked of what's going on. We're doing one on Saturday. Uh, That's awesome. Yep. And then we've got uh, one in November and, and one was just booked in March, believe it or not. So I, you know, I told Stu, I'm like, if we're, if we're not careful, man, we play this thing too many times. We're going to actually get good at it. We gotta, we gotta watch that. But uh, yeah, well, you know, my friend Mary Ellen just did a, um, her third annual, except for last year when there was nothing, um, Linda Ronstadt tribute with a, you know, super all-star band. Yeah. Pretty, pretty big band, you know, three background singers, two guitar players, keys, uh, uh, pedal steel, drums, bass, uh, and a sit-in violin. Nice. And, you know, they are labors of love and you kind of have to position them as the net value. It's fun to play with the best players in, in the area. That's, that's a fun thing for everybody. Sure. Um, but you know, nobody can say, it, it, you know, the, the economics are of it and the specialness of it, you know, you can't do it every week and still do well. You could no. take it no, to you different have corners to. of the Bay area, right? Like, like yeah, 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 there's yeah. more audiences than the one, but I will tell you, and this will blow your mind. Like, you know, you and I have these very interesting talks about the differences in our regional area. So, so this one, there's a, there's a local winery that is big that, um, that, uh, has great built in base and, you know, the house rockers play their, their concert series. And now he's getting into these special events. He actually writes a pretty good sized check flat fee to basically buy this out. And then he sells the tickets and bundles them with a dinner or a wine tasting or something like that, um, for, uh, other people. And, you know, we're talking four or five, 600 people will, you know, came oh, to yeah, this. And that's so, great. You know, so now you're getting to some kind of scale where, where, okay, you know, it's worth it. Yeah, there's you know, money on paid, the table. Yeah. Money, yeah, money is being created, right? Yeah. And then there's the satisfaction of, of doing it. Uh, you took this, t tell me what was the, the your gut reaction when you were asked to do it? Did you take it because fun new challenge? You yep. love that music? You know, it, I, what went through your mind the second you were asked? Fun new challenge. That's, that's, that's all I need. That, you know, that's so for, yeah. so for anybody pitching me for gigs out there, uh, you know, that, that I knew that it would be interesting. I knew that I, I enjoyed, I mean, I enjoy Stu's company. I, I, I've enjoyed playing with him. I figured I would enjoy doing this and, and I did. It was, you know, it was interesting. We get there and I, you know, I think we were all a little on edge about, 
how this was going to work. Cause you know, as we're getting there, I'm learning, Oh, the thing's sold out. Like, Oh crap. Like, okay, this is going to be a serious thing here. Okay. Uh, fine. So I'm bringing my congas in and I put my congas on stage. And I have to go back down to the car to get the stand or whatever. And uh, as you I had lower expectations for, um, what the final, or you were just kind of wide eyed. We'll wait and see. We'll what wait everybody and see. I had no idea. Yeah, exactly. Did you assume that other people don't prepare as good as you? Like, oh, are you just n- no, in general? I, I knew everybody was prepared for this. Like they, they were, I mean, every, everybody in this particular project, the, the risk if, of anything would be that they would be sort of over-focused on the music and over-focused on the charts. I should say it, not, not over-focused on the music like that. They, they are, they are studious players. Uh, the, the, the other guys in, in this project. Um, and so that it. that it was never a concern that they would not be able to figure out where we were and how to play or anything like that. No, 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 no. They, if anything, it would be like, Oh, who's going to perform for these people. And there, and there was a moment of that right after I put my congas on stage, I, I said to Stu before I started setting them up, I'm like, man, you know, before I, I start setting things up, where, what's your vision of this? Where do you want me to be? And he's like, right there. And I'm like, wait, wait, no, no, that's the front of the stage. The, the, I don't need to be at the front of the stage. He's like, yep, you're right next to me. And he's like, cause you and me are going to be the ones that look at the crowd and perform. The other guys are going to be looking at their music. I'm like, uh, yeah, clever. boy, that would have been a good thing to think about. No, in advance, yeah. yeah. Cause I'm singing, I was the only one singing harmonies with him. And that record has harmonies all the way through it. And we really had never properly rehearsed any of those. We'd talked through them. We'd sang a little bit, but it was like a lot of things that happened uh, on Thursday night happened for the very first time. In fact, we got to the end of the gig and and our organ player, Mike Evenberger, said to me, he's like, man, he's like, I'd never heard your harmonies at rehearsals. I'm like, yeah, I know. And, uh, and he's like, I, that, that was great. He's like, this record's full of them. I didn't know how that was going to go. He's like, but it worked out great. I'm like, yeah, thanks, man. You know, it was great. And, I mean, we all, everybody appreciated how everybody played, especially uh, like, I'm just a sucker for a Hammond, you know, with a B3 or B3 with a Leslie. It's and a great sound. He, Mike, there was one moment I was set up right next to him. And there was one moment I looked over and he's in the middle of this solo and like nine of his fingers are on nine of like the top 13 notes on, on, on the keyboard there. And it's just like got the Leslie swirling and it's like this orgasmic peak of, of his solo. And I look at his face and it's just deadpan. He's just like, mm, do, 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 like pushing <laughs> buttons and things like that. And it's like, man, like, look at what you're doing right here. This is crazy. Funny. Yeah. But it was great. It was good. Yeah. So I have more questions, but before I go too deep down this rabbit hole with you, I need you to tell people about our awesome sponsor for the week. I would love to tell everybody about Banzoogle because Banzoogle is is our sponsor for the week. And Banzoogle is built by musicians for musicians. It is an all-in-one platform that makes it easy to build a beautiful website and electronic press kit for your music. And the best part is, I mean, that, there's a lot of best parts. One of the best parts is that Banzoogle has all the features that you need for a professional website already built in, including things like hosting a, a custom domain name, right? So, you know, you, you can have your own domain, like like svhouserockers.com is a Banzoogle site. Soon, flingrocks.com will be a Banzoogle site. We're moving our yeah. stuff over. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they, and, th- and there's a reason that we're moving things over. A, They have dozens of fully customizable design templates, so no longer do I have to be the nerd that figures out how to do this stuff in what is not my free time anymore. Anybody in the band now can edit the web page, right? This is great. They have all the tools to sell our music and merch. We're going to be releasing some new songs. They do all that commission-free. And again, I don't have to play the role of the nerd trying to figure out how to piece all that together. Banzoogle already has those nerds on staff. They've figured out how to do it. And so they are just getting it done. Things like commission-free crowdfunding, fan subscription features, your mailing list, your social media interactions, all backed by live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. Really, the best part, though, is this. As a GigGab listener, you can go to Banzoogle.com and try it free for 30 days and then use the promo code GigGab, that's all one word, G-I-G-G-A-B, to get 15% off your first year of any subscription. That's Banzoogle.com, promo code GigGab, and our thanks to Banzoogle for sponsoring this episode. It's so, you know, one last thing about Banzoogle, and again, yeah, I've been a happy customer for several years. Yeah. It is the fastest way to put a professional face on your 
probably your most useful marketing tool, right? Yeah. Like we've all seen so many bad band websites, you know, mm-hmm. hundreds of different fonts, you know, strangely placed media players, you know, <laughs> just, you know, I, I may have built awkward, one or two of those over the years. Yes. You know, terrible navigation, just all sorts of things that make it hard for you to just get your information in front of people. I agree. And the, among the many great things about Banzool, and again, they've thought through things like selling merch and, you know, putting media players out there and, you know, how to do, you know, uh, you know, photo uh, carousels and in a lot of interesting ways. It's just so easy to get a professional face on your marketing efforts. It is, it is, I'm still such a happy customer. I'm going to build um, uh, a Paul Kent music you oh, know, for my nice. solo stuff. Yeah. So I'm, I, I wouldn't, I will be a two time customer. There you go. Yeah. Again, banzoogle.com promo code gig. Yeah. And our thanks. Right. To Banzoogle. Yeah. Hey, Thank you know, you talking about all of this, th- th- talking about this thing I did with Stu, you know, it's one thing that I, that I've done recently. I, evidently I'm going to be doing it again. Cause it's on my calendar to do again, but it's, it's, in the scope of what I do, this was unique, right? I, I don't generally go out and play. In fact, I don't think I've ever gone out to play just an album, right? And so that was a cool thing. And it, it I was reflecting on all of the things that I get to do. Uh, each of them is, is, is unique, right? I, I play with Bitter Pill. Obviously, you know, we're playing our original songs. We, of course, play some covers and, and you know, traditional music in that. But we, we serve a certain audience and certain vibe with certain material. And then uh, I play with Fling. Hopefully we're going to be doing more of that as we figure out what to do and which bass player we want to have in the band and figure all that out. Fling is different music because it's original music and we're really refocusing Fling on on our original music. We've got some songs that uh, we're just finishing up here. And so... And then, you know, and then I play like with Monkey Fist and that is the acoustic thing with, you know, which is cover tunes, but it's a different thing than anything else I do. And I appreciate that. Like if someone were to come and see me play, you know, multiple times in a month, they could see very different things each time. And I think there's some benefit to that. Oh, absolutely. Right. Because, because I, you know, I mean, certainly if let's say bitter pill, you know, this summer, you know, we were playing, I, there were probably some months where we had six gigs or something like that, which is a lot for, for that band. So if you come see bitter pill six times in a row, you're going to get a lot of the same th- material. You'll get some mix up here and there. Cause we, we try to mix things up both for our audience and for ourselves, but there's a lot of, of things that you're going to see the same and it's the same sort of vibe. And so I get that you might not want to see bitter pills six times in, in the course of four weeks, right? You know, yeah. you might want to spread that out six times over the course of a year and that's okay. Right. No problem. We serve different audiences. We play different places. Like you, you'd be smart about how you book things, but you can play for the same people as long as you, I, I think, as long as you're delivering something different. In fact, I had a friend, the thing that started me thinking about this is I had a friend that I did not know was coming to this this gig. There were so many people there that I that I knew. And then even more than that, there were people there that knew me that I had no idea who they were. They're like, oh, I'm so happy to see you involved in this. I'm like, that, that's amazing. Thank you. I have no idea who you are, but it's cool. <laughs> um, and, but, you know, like, and he said, he's like, oh, yeah, when you told me about this, I immediately bought tickets because it's different. It's not something I've seen before and it's not something he's seen me do before. And so he was like, oh yeah. And he and his wife were there and it was like, great, enjoy. I got to go, you know? And, um, I assume they enjoyed it. I don't know. They were gone by the time I, I got back out there after we played, but, uh, it, you know, it, I think there's benefit in being judicious with how you Select gigs because you asked me, you know, how did you take this gig? Stu told me what it was, and I was like, I'm in. You know, I didn't even know what instrument I was playing, and I was like, I'm in. You know, we'll figure <laughs> the rest out, right? Seriously, you know. And so, I think there's benefit to that. Oh, absolutely. You know, I have I have so much to say about this. So now, dance with me around this subject because the counterpoint to this is, you know, your job is to entertain people, right. and you know, and we have said, you know, no. No points for being clever, right? So, so in in certain cover band scenarios, right, there is um, uh, there is a 
perspective that, you know, the reason that you haven't seen my sweet home Alabama yet, you know, is, <laughs> is you Turn know, it's because people, yeah, exactly. <laughs> people want to hear, you know, that. So, so that would be the other thing, but I, I actually, I'm, I side a lot more with the perspective that you're giving here. It kind of goes along with our always be performing thing. Like yeah, in be. all things you do, are they, is it, are you making a conscious decision to raise the level of engagement with the people that you are cultivating as fans. I, and I'll give you a couple examples. So one is very, 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 very rarely will I play any house rocker song when I play solo acoustic. And in fact, interesting, very, unless someone asks for it. So that, you know, there are a couple songs that the house rockers have, you know, put in a, in a show that, that people seem to like, and sure. you know, it, 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 are, are, are a little bit different. And if they come see me, or if they come see me and like if any other house rockers are sitting in, I might get a request and then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do a request. But the way I kind of approach my music life is, you know, the house rockers are its thing. And then my acoustic shows tend to be a lot mellower. And I actually had a, a friend say to me, you know, God, you, you're so mellow when you do acoustic stuff. I'm expecting the guy who is in front of the house rockers. High so energy, I'm like, house rocker, I'm like, front man. I'm like, yeah. Exactly. That's that's why, you know, like, like this is another side of my brain that I do to kind of emote some different music. And I'm very committed to trying to keep the solo acoustic singer songwriter vibe when I play acoustic. So people kind of know that, you know, it's, it's going to be a different thing. That's Sometimes, interesting because you know, like Monkey Fist w evolved and I didn't have anything to do with any of this. I was invited to play in Monkey Fist um, after it formed and then invited to play in Chafed after that. But Chafed came first and then Monkey Fist was essentially billed to be acoustic chafed, an acoustic subset of chafed. But a lot of the songs were the same between the, the two lists, but very different in terms of the I, performance. I could see that. Right? I, the, so, I could understand that. So doing, if it was the house rockers unplugged, yeah. that would be different. Right. right. So I, I get that. Right. And actually that makes sense from a brand perspective to me. I mean, exactly. if you think about how, how popular those MTV unplugged things were like a chance to see familiar material reimagined, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, but my, uh, solo acoustic life is a different life than my, than my house rocker fronting the house rocker band sure. thing. And, 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 and at least to me, very consciously, I try to, I try to do those types of things. I value, um, other musicians who try to take a, add something unique. You know, if, if we're talking holistically about, you know, what makes scenes valuable, if everybody's singing the same songs, you know, that to me is a boring and B redundant and repetitive. Doesn't, it doesn't make a vibrant, you know, like I can go over, if I can, if, if, I, if all I have to choose from on a Friday or Saturday night is to go here, sweet home, Alabama in, in one of three venues, that's not that interesting to me, but you know, like my, you know, remember we had Psychotis on here, you know, yeah. he encyclopedic memory for songs does a lot of requests kind of specializes in early seventies AM gold stuff. Simon started doing um, kind of specializing in eighties stuff. And, you know, so it, it is a different repertoire. Yeah. He's got, you know, he's Mariel, got the eighties and the nineties, I think is Simon's yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Right. Yep. And I, you know, kind of do uh, more, you know, kind of a blend of acoustic Springsteen and Petty and, and, yeah. you know, then some of my favorite, you know, singer songwriter things when I do acoustic and I try largely to stay solo. Like I try not to add a band, but sometimes I will add a drummer. Like there's certain places that, that it might be okay. Sure. But I, yeah, I know, try when I'm, when I'm choosing a band to play in or invited to play in a project. I mean, if it's a sub thing, that's totally different, right? In fact, if it's a sub thing, I, I like it a whole lot. If the song list is similar to something else, I already know, right? Like that's great. But otherwise playing, going out and playing the same songs with a, with two different bands, for example. And I've, I've been in scenarios where I've found myself where it's like, Oh, you know, these two bands are similar. Mm -hmm. Maybe they, they gravitated to be similar. And maybe that's even my fault, right? Where <laughs> Because if I'm in them, it's like, Oh, I know this song, this works well, we should play it. But it, it gets, I lose, I lose interest in playing the same song with multiple projects uh, in general. I mean, there's times where it's like, oh, I like the way we do it here. I like the way we do it here. But a lot of times it's confusing. It's like, you know, to go back to our, our litmus test, it's like, oh, wait, crap. Which way does this band end American Girl? Like, you know, if I'm yeah. asking myself that question and it's not a sub gig or there's not some asterisk as to why this is happening, 
then it's like, all right, well, why am I, you know, why am I choosing to spend my limited amount of time doing the same thing I'd like to do if I'm going to plan multiple projects? And I, I am a firm believer that to one of the best ways to expand as a musician is to play with different people in multiple projects and all of that good stuff. I really, I am a firm believer in that. It was drilled into me by my drum teacher early on John Catron and, uh, and it, it has served me well. So I, I still live that vibe today, but it's, I'm not just going out and playing the same songs with different people. It's, it's different yeah. material and, and you know, it's great. And I, I love it when I'm on a gig and realize, Oh wow, these guys are way heavier cats than me. And that definitely happened with this, this what's going on thing. Like, you know, some of these, like the drummer there, he's without question, a you know, better drummer than me in, in a lot of ways, perhaps in all of the ways. Um, and it was great being able to play with him. Such a pleasure. I don't get the opportunity to be on stage with drummers all that often, as you might imagine. And right. it, the, it, Oftentimes when I am, I find myself frustrated that I am not the one playing the drums because by golly, it could be better you, that, you know, that, that comes to mind. And I, I, you know, perhaps that's a character flaw, but I had zero of that feeling the other night or with any of these rehearsals. It was not like, oh crap, he picked the wrong drummer. It was like, oh crap, he picked the right drummer. Like the, I'm, I'm, this guy's great. And what a pleasure it was to be able to just lock in with him and, and go. So yeah, I don't know. Where I was you know, it's so that. funny. Yeah. As as you and I have this conversation in so many different modes over the years, you know, you think about projects that you pick to join. And um you, you know, you are a musician who will step into different situations, right? And yeah. my whole perspective as you know is largely projects to organize. Like 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 Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, and and then selecting people to and and I think in the middle of both of our experiences is encompasses most of the types of people who listen, right? Like, you know, you are either, Hey, you know, what can I do to take my band to an, you know, another place or what's my next thing for my personal career yeah. or how do I be a working musician? So I think in there is, is really kind of a sweet spot of where our conversations go related to the unique stuff. I kind of have two, two more thoughts. One is, yep. um, Unique is hard. You know, I, I, I just saw a post on like cover band central of some band in Pennsylvania. So all the way across the country that started a kind of an acoustic combo. They posted their set list. I was like, Oh shit, that's 70% of my set list. Right. And I thought I was, you know, being fairly unique. Um, so there is, so there's there is reason. no fairly unique, right? Unique you're, is you're right. It is a binary term. And I, I, Thank you. I, 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 I know I've, I've done this before, but like, I feel like, this is a term I don't want to lose the definition of because we we only have one term that that is that means unique and it is unique in two ways. I so get it. I, it, like it's important to me that we don't say it's super unique or extra unique or very unique or somewhat unique. No, no, it's very is, it's unique or it's not or yep. it's not unique. Could be very rare. L there let me go. say unique is hard. Unique you know, is you, hard. You, it's very right? hard. Yeah, but in, in the cover band world, unique is hard to go and find. Absolutely. Songs that you can perform great that will, you know, again, you're a cover band. So, you know, you're, you're representing music to, uh, that someone else has written and made, made well known, um, to, to find that sweet spot of a, of a catalog of songs that, uh, you know, will retain you an audience that you can play well, you know, that keeps you working, you know, that, that, that is a good, a noble quest, I would say. Yeah. And the other thing is, but here's the corollary to it. It's less hard if you look harder. So, for example, um, uh, I love Rob Thomas, the singer for Matchbox 20 and a great sure. solo artist, right? Yeah. I love his voice. I love his vibe. I love his songwriting. Um, you can find, through the magic of the internet and YouTube, plenty of examples of Rob Thomas playing not only his solo stuff, but also Matchbox 20 stuff in stripped down, unplugged formats that are different arrangements Connected to the original arrangement, but different arrangements. He has um, a series of things that he's done where he's just him and, and, a, and one other guitar player that are beautiful, beautiful arrangements of songs. Yeah. And um, and uh, so it 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 doesn't have to be torturously hard to be unique. You know, you can find it takes atten ways. attention and intention. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's it. Anyway, yeah. yes, unique is good. I hate it when I 
find a song that I don't think anybody else in my area is doing or a unique arrangement and I do it. And then all of a sudden I see someone else doing it as well. I just, you know, I'm like, that's lazy, you know, go find your own freaking songs, build your own repertoire, build your own vibe and do your thing, you know, be your thing that I value that as a strength, you know, as a, as a good character quality in, in fellow musicians. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess I, I don't have that reaction to other cover bands because it's all cover music, right? I mean, if you're playing somebody else's songs, then th that door is wide open for somebody else to play that song, right? If you want to be truly unique, there I am with a modifier, uh, <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you play your own songs, right? Like that's the way to do it. Um, or really, really take those songs other people have written and change them or present them in a way that, only you can do and do the Zappa version of stairway to heaven. Yeah. Was, right. I mean, Zappa, Zappa played some covers and they were very much Zappa songs, right? Like, you know, so yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, that's enough. Let us know what you think. Feedback at gigabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. And, uh, I don't know. That's what I got for today. You got anything else, man? No fun chat. Yeah, it was a fun chat. It was good. I get to go do something, well, something that is unique, it turns out, because I have to go rehearse Madhouse for the final time. It is ending, and I'm actually quite thrilled about the that, that it's ending, because it's... Time to move on. Yeah, it's time to move on. It was time to move on. I thought we had moved on, and then uh, and then pandemic happened and sort of refueled the desire for it, so I was like, okay, well, we'll just do this one last time. But I'm glad to have that be... You know, coming to a close. It's a good thing. So you know what I have to say. What do you have to say? Always be forming, performing, and be pretty unique. 